Hi everyone. Welcome to our six part oil painting series where we will complete a single painting over six sessions, breaking up the very difficult task of completing an oil painting into six smaller manageable little wedges. And tonight will be part one of painting a Tuscan villa, the drawing. In this uh, drawing segment, we will deal with three major things that will help you to have more accurate drawings and also translate your image, either from life or a photo reference or a sketch, onto your canvas. The three things we'll use in our uh, drawing approach will be diagrammatic lines, the unit, and negative shapes. So let's jump right in and we will deep dive into uh, a bunch of other topics as well. Talk about our purpose with all of this and talk about the design, the intention, and all that. But okay, let's jump right in. Um, so, of the three diagrammatic lines, the unit and negative shape, uh, the first one, diagrammatic lines, um, uh, an example of that would be the grid. Uh, diagrammatic lines are a series of vertical and horizontal lines, but also diagonal lines. And they are used in such a way for us to... Um, it enables us to have more accurate drawings. And you can see right here, one of the most obvious examples is the grid. Um, many years ago, I was a mural painter and we would make a small drawing that was called a maquette. And the maquette was a small reference drawing that typically the patron would approve before we transferred it onto the wall to do the mural. And this grid enabled us to... Um, draw the image accurately and translate it from the actual sketch to the wall. Interestingly, the Sistine Chapel was drawn out this way by Michelangelo and his studio assistants transferred it via this grid system. It's the series of verticals and horizontals. Your verticals and horizontals or your grid can be as simple as a um, crosshairs, you know, just one line vertical, one line horizontal. The more challenging the drawing or it, the more insecure you are about your drawing abilities, just add more verticals and more horizontal lines. And this one is a pretty typical one. This is what I call the tic-tac-toe or the rule of thirds or two lines down and uh, two lines across. Um, and as you can see in our photo reference, I've done the same thing on our photo reference. And it really is as simple as looking and translating the information from your photo reference grid onto your canvas. Um, Okay, so let's begin. One of the first things I look for is what's called the high reader. <clears throat> the high reader are the most obvious lines, so the ones that are right in your face. And um, one that I see that looks pretty easy is right here. You can see the Tuscan Villa itself actually goes right along this line right here, this um, vertical line. Also right next to it, where the roof meets the facade of this building, we can see a really nice horizontal line. That's, that's a high reader. And so those, those are sort of like little gifts, and I sort of just take those right away. Um, so let's begin. I think uh, we'll start with those lines right there. I can see that this Tuscan villa on the right, it goes up about, just about halfway. Halfway up here, right? That looks about right to me. And it ends just about at the bottom here where it meets a little bush. Uh, that is my first line. Boom. And it's already there for me. Okay. Now, about halfway across here, I draw our line. It looks like it's just about straight across. Just a little bit more than halfway, right? It comes into contact with the neighboring villa or Fratoria the farmer's quarters, or the, the worker's quarters. And this looks like it, you know, I think I might have that too low. Yes, maybe I do. Mm. It's playing tricks on me already, okay. Well, let's see, let's find, I can see that the roof exits the canvas 
right about here, right at the top of the roof and the bottom of the roof. And this does this. Look about right. Yeah. That looks about right to me. Um, so we said that diagrammatic lines are a series of horizontal and vertical lines, but they're also diagonal lines. And there's a really neat way to sort of check the accuracy of your diagonal lines. Take, for example, the pitch of this roof that I just drew in. Now, if you look at the photo reference and you think of your pitch as a clock, if you can tell time, you can get the accurate pitch of, um, of any rooftop or line or diagonal in your painting or drawing. Um, so, as you can see here, this points to, what would you call that? Somewhere between, if that's 12, there's one that's two-ish, somewhere between one and two maybe, right? And so it's a matter of checking your reference and then checking your drawing. Okay, very good. I can see that this line comes down here, not quite halfway, maybe one third down to there. And let's see. Okay, now we have another high reader right here in the form of this uh, horizontal where the facade meets the pitch of the roof there. So let's find where the roof touches this villa right here, just above this line here. It's kind of that easy. Um, but let, let's use a, let's use a diet, let's find, um, accuracy using a diagrammatic line as well, shall we? Let's say we want to find the top of this roof here, the top of the roof. Well, we know that by looking at it, and if you look at your photo reference, you can see that, you know, it's not quite, it's, it's slightly lower than halfway the distance of here, right? If this is the, uh, my top quadrant, if I split that in half, I can see that the top of that villa is Oh, what would you say? Maybe three-fourths of the way down, somewhere around there, right? And I'll show you a neat way to check our accuracy. And the more you check and the more careful you are using diagrammatic lines, the more accurate your drawings can be. So it really it's really just a matter of, um, of being patient and checking, okay? So let's, let's check on this roof. So... If we try to find the height of it, I'd, I'd say that that's the halfway point, that's the quarter point. That looks about right to me. But then you look at marks like this, right? And we can find where this pitch meets the top of the roof here. And so if you draw an imaginary line that goes right through it, you can see that that is, if that's the half, it's probably at the quarter, right? Half and... Hmm. So I can see I have a little flaw in my, uh, I have a big flaw in my drawing. Uh, you can see I've completely left out this part of the uh, villa. <laughs> you see that? It actually comes about almost halfway through here. And so it's an excellent little device to, to sort of fix your drawings. Um, and if you have a willy-nilly drawing, uh, it doesn't matter how good your colors or your painting, um, your values are, it will be an inferior infrastructure. So you've got to get your drawing right. So, simple fix there. Okay, that's slightly to the right of the halfway point. So we'll move that back here as well.
You gotta keep your eyes open, right? Okay. I can see that this little bush down here ends slightly to the left of the halfway point here, right about there. Right. Let's try that again. Our, um, our, our roof, our second roof comes up here and it reaches a height that's slightly below this line here. All right, if I was to draw a diagrammatic line, an imaginary horizontal right there, and it comes all the way to the edge. Oh, it does not cut short right there. It comes down like that. It looks about right. Very good. This vertical comes approximately halfway down, then turns in. Then we have our cypress tree, which comes up here, exits the canvas, comes back down here. And so again, I'm dealing with uh, halves, right? Halves and holes. Um, and this looks like it actually could probably come into the right a little bit. Because if I look at the negative shape to the right of it, it was, it was probably, probably should have a, a little bit less negative shape there. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, um, let's, discuss the unit. The unit is simply proportions, height versus width, that kind of thing. And the units are great little devices because um, a unit is simply measurement. So if I use my tool and I measure the width of this tree and then I, me I, I measure it across, say, the facade to get the correct width of the facade, I can see that it's one, two trees gets me right there. And in my photo reference, I can see that this could, uh, it's its too big. The facade is too big. It's, it's funny, that's an old habit that I have. For some reason, when I draw buildings, I tend to draw them much too large. So I'm gonna pull that in a little bit. Pull my cypress tree in. And could be a little fatter too. beef up our little cypress tree. One, two, that's more like it. So, positive and negative shapes, the unit, diagrammatic lines. So look, look at the negative shape here. The negative shape is just as important as the positive shapes in, in terms of checking for your accuracy. So if we look at this little abstract puzzle shape right here and then let your eyeball zip over to your photo reference or if you happen to be painting or drawing from nature, you can uh, check for accuracy that way as well. And this line looks like it's coming in too low. So really, drawings are really just giant mistakes that we're constantly crafting to improve upon. All right. Okay. Once you have, um, once you're cooking, it's easier to sort of um, measure everything else off of things that you already have there. And like, let, let's see, for example, look at the negative shape here. When I look at the, the negative shape, I can see that the pitch needs to be pointing more in this direction, right? It needs to be closer to nine o'clock. How about that? And so again, you can do that with a with diagrammatic line, or sometimes the the um, negative shape will help you see it more clearly. So it's a combination of all three of these when working together can 
increase the accuracy of your drawing. Okay. Let's move around the drawing, shall we? I notice that the road comes down here. It exits the canvas right here, just before this grid line. And it comes out just about halfway, right? And then it turns and exits this column or this quadrant, we'll call it, sure. This grid line right about there. You see that? So we're, <clears throat> now we are, um, I can, if you carefully look and observe and break that curve down into smaller wedges, it really is, there's a pitch that goes this way, and then it goes this way, and then the pitch goes this way. And so we are taking something fairly large and complex and breaking it down into its smaller components. We're chunking, breaking it into smaller chunks. It's called chunk doing and chunk learning. Okay, looks good. Trying to find the bottom of this building. I can see it is, if this is the halfway point here, it's slightly left to the halfway point. It exits the canvas right about there. And the pitch is pretty extreme, right? So again, hold your tool up to the reference and then hold your tool up and try to replicate it in the drawing. And this one looks like it is slightly north of nine o'clock. If this is nine, this pitch turns slightly upward. And it's helpful to know that it exits the canvas right about here, right? So if you look at this column and note where that piece of building exits the canvas. So using that, the pitch, and I'll show you a clever way to use a diagrammatic line as well. So if you, a diagrammatic line would be if you were to continue this, right? So it stops here, but if you continue an imaginary line what would it pass through, right? It looks like it would intersect this line here and move up there. Yeah, that looks all right. That looks good. You can keep these lines in or erase them if they're distracting you, but they're just helpful little devices to sort of help you, help you guide your way through to accurate drawing. How about that? Okay. Okay, finding the top of this, we can see that if this is the halfway point, it's slightly, it exits the canvas slightly above the halfway point. Again, there's the halfway point. Look at your photo reference. You can see that the wall exits just above the halfway point there. And note, if this is nine o'clock, the pitch points downward. This is following perspective. Check it, use your tool. This is just about halfway, slightly to the left of this line, right? This line comes here and slightly to the left of that. We see that this line comes down there. This Tuscan Villa is in a small Tuscan town. It's in a place called Spanocchia, Spanocchia, Italy. Maybe an hour just outside of Florence. And this image is from a workshop that I taught a few years back in Tuscany. Pinch myself, right? It was so lovely. It was a uh, a long flight and a layover and it was lots of travel. And as soon as I arrived, the car dropped us off and we walked down uh, this little road, which led us to the scene here. 
And I think I had been up for almost 20 to 24 hours after arriving in Florence. We had a bus that picked us up later. And um, so we'd spent some of the day in Florence. So I was pretty tired. I was uh, jet lagged. And wiped out and all I wanted to do was just get to sleep but it was daytime it was beautiful I was ramped up because I was so excited to be there and I came upon this scene and I literally dropped my gear and just did a small little plein air painting yeah you can see the plein air painting here and so what we're doing the whole idea behind this Tuscan villa is and this is a pretty common practice where you'll take a plein air painting and then in the studio, you'll craft it to improve upon the design or just bring it to another level. It, it, it doesn't mean it's better than the plein air painting. It's just different. It's just another artistic extension. That's all it is. These little bits are going to be tricky. This is going to require more careful drawing and observation, but breaking it down into something called the envelope. Um, you can see a short video I did if you go to my YouTube channel and look for a YouTube video called The Envelope. You can, um, you can find how I, um, take smaller parts within a drawing, like these little, this little vase here, and find how to accurately draw it. It's, uh, in any case, the, um, if you look at the design here, there's a, a few things I was interested in doing in the design. You can see, um, from the plein air painting, I did a version of this. I did a studio version and I liked it enough. It was, it was, um, I want one quick observation. Let me interrupt myself. <laughs> I'm trying to find the placement of this door here. And if you look at the distance between here and here, and you split it in half approximately. That's approximately where the door is, right? Okay, good. You know, one thing I should point out is that, you know, deadpan accuracy isn't always the goal. But as a skill set for an artist, it's a good place to be, right? So if you want to be more expressive and you're less interested in you know, photorealism, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, one of the larger objectives to making art is to create uh, your own expression, right? Is that your mark making and the, the painting or drawing or the work of art, the thing you're working on, is an extension of you. It looks like it's uniquely made from your hand. And so for that reason, it doesn't have to look like the photo, but it's a lovely skill set. And if that's what you would like, then by all means, have it look like the photo. I can see just above this door is this little vase. It's catching a piece of light. That's, that's to me what I'm interested in, that little piece of light. Lovely. And the rear half is in shadow. You can see I'm not even drawing that in. Okay. There's a third one here. And I can always just look at the one to the left of it and carry on the illusion. Okay. So, um, it started with a plein air sketch. And then from the plein air sketch, I took it to my studio once I returned home from Italy and I did this version here. You can see this was a uh, 12 by 16. The original plein air painting was an eight by 10. And I took it and the studio version was a 12 by 16. Those are completely different proportions, uh, but it was perfectly fine. It's not that uncommon to change proportions on the fly. Um, but I read somewhere that Winslow Homer did 17 versions of his Gulf Stream painting. If that's true, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I kind of 
It makes sense to me, you know? There's been so many times where I'll complete a painting and then it might sit on a, on a shelf or something and I walk by it sometime later and I say to myself, you know, I feel like I could improve upon that painting. Or it just haunts your dreams, you know what I mean? It, it, you get an idea that, oh, you know, if I could have another shot at that, I think I could, I think I could, I could try, I don't know, let me, let me explore. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes I write and sometimes it just gets worse, I don't know. But uh, these things, they can haunt your dreams, right? And so this will be the third attempt at doing this. And all I really want to do is, I want to, it's a slight, in my view, what is a slight improvement. So take another look at the, um, the 8x10 a la prima study, or the plein air painting that I did. Uh, so because of the proportions are different, one of the things I like about the plein air painting, and it's very sketchy and loose, uh, as opposed to the, the, uh, the more carefully drawn and executed studio painting, but there's a freshness and um, immediacy and expression in the plein air painting that appeals to me. But I really like the diagonal light on the grass in the foreground, as opposed to the more horizontal light that I did in the studio version. You see the difference there? That's interesting, right? Wow. For some reason, those diagonals uh, create a tension a, just a different kind of tension. It doesn't make it better or worse, but in my view, I feel it will be a stronger painting if those tensions of the diagonals complement all the strong verticals and horizontals in this painting. If you look at um, this painting, there are very strong uh, verticals all over the place, repeated verticals. Uh, the buildings, the cypress trees, the little doorways, all of these linear elements that are strong verticals in, the, in their rhythmic across the canvas. And the same is true for these horizontals. There's a lot of little horizontals on the roof lines um, and uh, the bush and um, even some, some lovely diagonals. But it's a combination of all these horizontals, verticals, and diagonals that essentially complement one another. And another thing that I thought I liked from the plein air painting was the fact that there was more foreground. I think it's because of the scale. The eight by 10 made the picture plane a little more boxy. And so I have more, more uh, area in the foreground. Okay. These trees back here, I, I remember wrestling with those quite a bit. Um, I thought they would, I painted them quite literally to the, to the uh, what I really saw in nature. And I didn't like, I, I, I thought I could improve upon that. And I'm really, I'm just looking for overlapping shapes. You know, one of the visual cues that enhances the illusion of three dimensions is this idea of overlapping shapes. Um, I'm trying to find the bottom of the cypress tree where the roots begin. And see how they, it's kind of ambiguous there. You know, you want to go. You don't want to go too high, too low. You can, of course, uh, you know, just check, right? And you can see that here's the halfway point at about the, th the quarter point. Right about here is where those roots meet the tree line. And really, there's just little pieces of light that are peeking through, and they sort of they're, they're, they're random but repeated shapes. They're verticals and diagonals. This kind of thing is happening in there. And I, I can be more careful about that. I don't know, but. I'm fine to sort of just kind of wing it and, and make little shapes in there. That's fine. They're little pieces of light. That's all they are. Light and shadow. Okay. We're closing in, are we not? Hmm. Okay, great. Now let's put in our um, our diagonal shadow. I love this piece. So you can see that the shadow exits the canvas right about here. And it's a slight diagonal. This is nine o'clock. 
You tilt it slightly, just to north of nine o'clock, and it comes to about there. And then this, you can, it sort of rolls over the grass a little bit, right? And it exits about halfway between here to here, approximately halfway. That's halfway, it's slightly below it, so right about there. Okay. And then you can see where it exits and enters. It, it touches it somewhere at the, maybe two thirds up, right? One, two thirds up right there, maybe. And so we simply join those. And then it comes to right about here. Maybe a little flatter, actually. There we go. Another subtle improvement, or I shouldn't say improvement, because honestly, I have no idea if it will improve upon it, other than changing the proportions, adding more to the foreground, and um, changing the horizontal shadows to uh, verticals. Um, I'm just exploring some things with tensions. Like, for example, I, I added these little birds in my studio version. You can barely see them. I, ne I never really committed to them. And I think in this painting, I'm going to commit to them a little bit more. You can see some birds sort of flying in the background. This is, we are poets, not reporters. I forget who said that, but I love that. And the idea is that, you, you know, you observe nature and then it filters through your creative imagination and your spirit and it comes out on the canvas portraying your unique visual voice or your unique poetry. And in mine, I had this warm light. It was much warmer than the uh, cool light that was actually there that afternoon. So in my world, it's more of a, a warm light, a warm earthy yellow. You can see I have a faint earthy yellow in the sky. That's, that's really just made up. I don't know. I just kind of like it. Um, in the, in my both paintings, this gravel road was painted blue. In my opinion, that blue was a little, it looked a little too artificial. There's a lovely shadow, uh, right here. It was strong, strong diagonal. Um, and you know, you could say this is one of the secondary focal points. It's certainly an area of, of, of much, of, of, of great interest, you know. Okay. Let's see. The, about two thirds of the way up. This is where these vines sort of swallow up the the uh, building. So cool. And this is, this is sort of made up too, you know. So again, we are poets, not reporters. We're not less interested in doing a incredibly accurate depiction of what's before me and more my poetic vision. I like what I have here though. I kind of like the the uh, negative and positive rhythm of, uh, of the vines.
In any case, I think I'm gonna have the birds come from this section. They're gonna flying in from the left to pull your eye in a tertiary manner. You know, as painters, we try to craft paintings in such a way that we control where the viewer's eye will enter the canvas, how it'll wind up on the focal point, move to areas of secondary interest and tertiary interest as well. Over here, there is another window, but I remember it was speaking too loud. It was drawing too much attention. So in the, at the painting stage, I had deliberately uh, diffused it and made it of less interest. I sort of grayed it out a little bit. And there's more lines over here. So academically speaking, there's an academic principle that says that the focal point should be somewhere in the middle to middle background. Now these, this is just an academic principle, that's all it is. Um, and so here we, um, there, there's a lot to look at here. This painting is, is, um, is about this Tuscan villa and it's really about the light, that Tuscan light. It's obviously coming from the left-hand side, but the way it illuminated this, um, this plant here really becomes my visual focal point, okay? So show, I wanna get the size of this. I, uh, and it's placed uh, as accurately as I can. And it looks to me like it is slightly to the left of the center of this, this one here, and slightly below the center as well. And I might have that a little too low. And I want the scale of it to be, I like that scale. And you can just take a unit, right? So you take a, a measurement of the width of it, and pick something, you know, it's like, observe how much wider it is than the door. Um, uh, take a measurement of it. What's the distance between the windows there, for example. So your unit can be, um, you know, as creative as you can measure your unit. Um, you can find creative ways to sort of uh, be incredibly accurate. These, these lovely little terracotta pots, and they're making a shadow too. You know, maybe the shadow goes onto the road behind it, possibly. There, there are four visual cues that help enhance the illusion of three dimensions when you're making paintings. I mean, after all, we are painting on a two-dimensional surface, right? And so one of those tools is linear perspective. So if you look at the road here, this road sort of pulls you into the composition. There's other areas of linear perspective right here on the road here, certainly, but things like this, these are linear perspective, linear pathways that pull you, pull you into the composition. And they're all sort of pointing towards the focal point. They're helping to reinforce your eyeball to move in that direction. But of course it's the light really right here that does it. And the onus will be on me to carry that effect throughout the painting, maintain the integrity of my intention. So the first visual cue is linear perspective. Okay, so we have that going for us. That's good news. The second is strong light source. And that is helping us set the, the stage for the drama of our painting here. I'll be illuminating these Notice how they are deliberately backlit by the dark green or dark greenish gray of the vines on the facade of the building here, right? That's intentional. That's one of the things that stopped my eye when I arrived there, was that light. We are painting light after all. Okay. So there's three little puff balls. I made those up. I think in my memory, I made them up. I'll have to look at the photo reference again, but yes. Okay. All right. Three little puff balls and a row of terracotta pots. Strong light source, linear perspective, 
overlapping shapes. Now this painting is packed with overlapping shapes. You've got the shadows overlapping the grass. The pots are overlapping the facade of the building. These buildings are all overlapping each other. And this building is overlapping the cypress trees, cypress trees overlapping here. And of course, everything is overlapping the skies. A foreground, middle ground, and background is an example of overlap as well. And overlapping shapes tell our brains that something is in front of something. And uh, that tells our brains that there is space and three dimensions are present. Okay. All right, what else? Now time to put in little accents, like these little windows here. Okay. So this window I can see falls just above this door. So it's, it's in a little more than I had it. And this is where, if I was to draw a, an imaginary diagrammatic line that split this door in half and kept going up, Right? And if you look at it in your drawing, it did the same thing. It comes, it would, it would be to the right of that little window. I mean, is it important that I actually put it in the, uh, the absolute right spot? Not really. But for those who are looking for super accuracy, it's, it's perfectly valid. So you do you, right? If you are a tight painter or drawer, you do you. At the end of the day, we can only be who we are, I suppose, right? Because everyone else is taken. <laughs> so just be you. All right. Um, the four visual cues that enhance the illusion of three dimensions. Linear perspective, strong light source, overlapping shapes, and scale. And of course, the pots themselves represent scale. The three pots, presumably the same size, but because one is closer, one is middle distance, one is further away, we see that they ascend and descend in shape. And this tells our brains that there's a distance between them, right? Boom, boom, boom. And there you go. Uh, there's a fifth way to, that, that we can uh, enhance the illusion of three dimensions. And that is with atmospheric perspective. But that has to do with more with color and value. Um, and we'll get into that in later sessions. Um, but for now, we will call this drawing quits with the exception of... Um, I'll let this set for a second, and then I will ink it in, let that set for another 10 to 15 minutes, and then we are good to go with our painting, our next stage, which would be the monochromatic underpainting, um, our grisaille. So, okay, I am going to use one of these um, Pigma brushes. It's uh, India ink and a disposable pen. It's by a company called Pigma. And they have um, pen nibs as well. For example, this is um, a number five nib below. And it is a nib as opposed to the paintbrush tip. I like the paintbrush tip. You can use whichever one you'd like. If, you, if you're like a super tight painter, I mean, then go ahead and use the Micron uh, pen nib. You can get a very fine line. Quite elegant, really, geez. Um, but the... Uh, I like to start as loose as I can and get tighter later. And so for that reason, I like this little nib here. It has a pretty dark, heavy line that I can see. Now remember, in the next stage, we will do a monochromatic underpainting. And so, you know, the older I get, the worse my eyes get. And so at some point, I think at probably like age 43, <laughs> my eyes started going. And I couldn't see my charcoal drawings under the monochrom one of the monochromatic layer. It's a fairly transparent layer, but by inking, it helps me to actually see it better. And these lines are pretty thick we will bury them in subsequent layers of paint. And I <clears throat> I actually like to have them because it reminds me to put more paint on there. Because the only way you're gonna bury these lines is by covering them with paint.
Okay, so there you have it. Uh, there is your step one of Tuscan Villa, the drawing, where we talked about diagrammatic lines, a series of a vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines that help us um, better find a placement of things and to check for our accuracy as well. There's also the unit, which is height versus width. If you want to measure the distances of things, how high something is, for example, we'll take a quick little unit of measurement of this door, and we see that this facade is almost two doors or two units tall. How about that? And this is one and almost two units wide. As creative as you can be taking various measurements of units, you can check incredibly accurate heights, widths, etc. Then there are negative shapes. These little bits in between little nooks where we check our negative shapes and we look at the character of them, right? These little, this little negative shape here, right? And then you, your eyeball goes from left to right, uh, observing your nature or your photo reference and then back to your actual painting. Okay, so there you go, two-dimensional linear drawing. The next step in the process will be our monochromatic grisaille underpainting. We will cover this in raw umber oil painting and do a wipe away by wiping away the lights and enhancing the dark. So be sure and join us for step two, the wipe away. Thank you so much.